Hey, good morning and welcome to Church at Home here at Grace Community Church, Winnipeg. We're thankful that you are joining us today. We are excited to be starting a new series as we look at an idea that sort of stemmed further from our previous series, but the cost of following Jesus. What does it look like on a daily basis to follow Jesus? So Pastor Scott will be starting that right away. We just wanted to make you aware of their, the stuff that's going on this summer. There's camps, there's a few other events throughout the summer. We're hoping that this summer is the best summer yet here at Grace. Uh, we're so thankful that we get to be a part of this community and we're really excited for all that the summer has in store. So we hope that you're soaking up the sun already. It was a hot week this past week. I saw that that one day Tuesday was the hottest um, hottest day for that particular date in Manitoba for like well over 100 years. I think 1910 was the last time that it was that hot. Pretty crazy is June. So we hope that you're soaking up the sun, whether you're at the cabin, whether you're camping, whether you're at home, whether uh, however you're watching this this morning, we, we just thank you for joining us and we hope that you have an amazing summer. Uh, just a note for next week, the July long weekend, we are having a watch party here at church. We're giving um, our worship team and the board decided to give the staff the, the long weekend off. And so we're having a, a watch party here at the church that will feel a little bit different, but there will be coffee, there will be snacks, there will be uh, people here to to have some fellowship with. So thank you um, for joining us today, and that's a heads up for next weekend. Let's get in to a song of worship together, and then Pastor Scott will be starting us off in our new series. Remember how far 
has been true and with all of my life I will worship you I will worship you Good morning friends this might be a musician thing. It's definitely a drummer thing, but there are certain songs that just grab hold of me and cause me to turn the volume up. It sometimes irritates my family because we can be in the car in the middle of a conversation and I'll just crank up the radio and say, listen to this for a second. Like my dad used to do this all the time. So I guess I come by it honestly. I can be in a restaurant and chatting with a friend and they'll all of a sudden start bobbing my head because I notice the soundtrack that's playing in the background. I'm distracted by the tune that I recognize. Sometimes I've even blurted out like, nice, in the middle of a conversation because of the song that I hear. And it's usually the like bass line or the drum groove that gets me first. I don't always notice the key or the lyrics. It's the feel, it's the tempo, it's the time signature. Like Jeff Picaro's Rosanna Shuffle will get me every single time. Death Cab for Cuties, Grapevine Fires, Tools, Numa. There's something about those rhythms that just grab a hold of me. And I imagine I've already lost a few of you. That last sentence probably sounded like a foreign language, but no worries. I think with this example, I can bring us all on the same page. Because nearly everyone knows the iconic Phil Collins drum fill. You know the one that I'm talking about. Even if you aren't a drummer, you've likely banged this one on the steering wheel of your car. Some of you are already playing it over in your head. I'm talking about in the air tonight. That slow burn, minimalist drum groove machine that's just, you know, for the first three and a half minutes in the background. And then there's that like bombastic 16th note fill that everyone recognizes. Even if you're not a drummer, you crank it up as you hear Phil sing, No Stranger to You or Me. You know what I mean. There's, there's something about that groove. Something about a rhythm that settles us in and takes us somewhere. And maybe it is more of a drummer thing, but I hope you can relate. I want you to think about rhythm for a moment today. I want you to think about tempo, about how fast or slow a song goes, how it moves along on the beat. And I want you to think about your life, the rhythm or the pace or the tempo of your life right now. Does it feel like your life is in a ballad? Maybe a power ballad, right? Something that's moving along kind of slowly. Maybe it feels like a waltz or maybe it feels like a dirge right now. Or maybe it's pounding along like a straight ahead rock and roll, four on the floor kind of tune. Or maybe you feel like it's going a little too fast. It's feeling like it's, you know, this is a punk rock song or, or worse yet, speed metal. Like there's blast beats you can't even keep up with. All of the drummers right now are loving the intro to this sermon. But what's the rhythm of your life right now? If you had to give your life a soundtrack, what sort of music would you hear right now? Someone once said the spiritual life is more of a dance than a march. This is difficult to understand if one's life is without rhythm. So for the next few weeks, I want to help us settle into a healthier rhythm for the summer. We just wrapped up our series, The Difficult Words of Jesus, and, and one common theme that seemed to weave its way through many of those passages was the cost of discipleship, what it means to follow Jesus. And for some, becoming a Christian is about praying a prayer and inviting Jesus into our heart. It's about having our sins forgiven and, and punching our ticket to heaven. And while making a decision to follow Jesus is one that many of us have done, that's just the first step in a life of daily decisions to follow Jesus. It's not just about making a one-time commitment. It's about daily committing ourselves to follow Jesus. We're going to use the same scripture that launched our last series to take us into this next one where Jesus calls us to take up our cross. In Luke 9, 23 to 25, he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. They must take up their cross daily and follow me. This is the call. This is the cost of discipleship. It is a daily surrender. It's a daily laying down of our lives. It's taking up our cross and following Jesus. 
Being a Christian is not just this one-time decision. It's a series of decisions that we make every day as we walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Following Jesus is a whole life endeavor. It's not just about going to church on Sunday. It's not just about having a quiet time first thing in the morning. It's about our whole life. So how do we engage with this? On a daily basis, how do we settle into a rhythm of life that allows us to walk in the ways of Jesus? I would suggest that the best place for us to start is actually to look at the life of Jesus. Start with the Gospels. What do we see Jesus doing? How do we walk with him when we see the way that he walked among us? What examples has he set for us? Let's talk about some of the things that Jesus did while he was here. First, we have to acknowledge the fact that what we have of the life of Jesus are stories. Uh, they're not bullet points. They're, they're not roadmaps for us to follow. It's not like we can, you know, just follow a checklist of to do things that Jesus laid out for us. We can pull some ideas and principles out of the stories, but we, it's not like we have a page out of his diary or a copy of his weekly schedule. You know, there's, there's no, you know, meet with Peter to discuss the, you know, being a fisher of men. There's no, you know, stop by Lazarus's tomb and raise him from the dead on Friday. Like there's none of those kind of notes that we can turn to. But there are moments in the Gospels that, that hint at some of the ways that Jesus walked on this earth and that maybe he's calling us to walk in the same way. There, there are ways we can be invited in following him in those things. Things that we see him doing that while he was here, we could find ourselves in a healthier rhythm of life, becoming more like him in the process. And one of those hints occurs a few times throughout the Gospels, and it's that Jesus spent regular time in prayer. Mark 1.35 says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Uh, the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, right after his baptism, before he begins any of his ministry, comes after a period of 40 days of, of fasting and praying while he's in the wilderness. Jesus spent regular time in prayer. Sometimes it was early in the morning, sometimes it was late at night. Luke 6, 12 says, one of those days Jesus went up to a mountainside to pray and he spent the night praying to God. Luke mentions Jesus' prayer habit perhaps more than any other gospel. In Luke 5, 16, it says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. But it wasn't only then. It wasn't just in these solitary occasions that he prayed. The disciples had seen him pray, so much so that they wanted to learn to pray the way that Jesus did. In Luke 11, it says that one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of the disciples said, Lord, would you teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples? So Jesus spent regular time in prayer, and following in his footsteps means that we likely should be spending regular time in prayer as well. And many of the stories that we find in the Gospels tell of ways that Jesus moving from those prayer times would go and engage with people and pour life and goodness into them. He blessed, he taught, he healed people, he regularly rubbed shoulders with, with people in the community and revealed the goodness of God to them. Matthew 8, 16 says, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all of the sick. People were coming to Jesus because of the blessing that he would be able to bestow on them, whether it was healing or deliverance. Um, Matthew 9, 20, verse, uh, sorry, yeah, Matthew 9, 20 and 20 to 22 says, Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. And Jesus turned and saw her. He says, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Jesus regularly poured into and blessed the people that were surrounding him, whether it was praying a blessing over the children that were brought to him or whether he was teaching about the kingdom of God, whether he was healing sickness or delivering from possession, Jesus poured himself into people, always seeking to lift them up and point them to the Father. He was motivated by that mission. In Luke 8, 18 and 19, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Favor. This is a passage that he read in the synagogue when he unrolled the scroll from Isaiah. He claimed that he was the fulfillment of that passage. Jesus knew his scripture. He knew where to find that in Isaiah, he often quoted what we would consider the Old Testament. 
but he often gave a fresh interpretation or a clearer understanding of what it meant to live according to those words. We find Jesus regularly eating with people and breaking bread with others. And one of my favorite stories comes from a meal at Levi's house. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus was on a mission to, to seek and save the lost, to, to redeem the broken, to, to bind up those who were brokenhearted, to bring freedom to the captives. He was going to restore, he was going to save. Perhaps the most famous passage in the Bible, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. So Jesus saw himself as on this mission from the Father, sent into the world. And as his followers, we have taken up that mission. We're on the same path. After his death and resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples just before he ascended to heaven. He said, it says this in John 20, 19 to 21, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then he blessed them with the Spirit and sent them out on mission. We see Jesus doing all of these things as he was sent into the world. That he was, you know, praying and blessing and healing and eating with sinners and revealing the kingdom. And in his final word to the disciples, according to Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 28, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So taking up our cross daily means walking in this mission that he's given us. It's following in his footsteps in doing what we saw him doing when he was here on earth. It includes at least, it includes at least a few of these kinds of things like prayer and fasting and reading scripture and fellowship and communion and teaching and loving others and sharing the good news. It's, it's about making disciples, being his representatives in the world today. So it's, it's more than just praying a prayer one time and inviting Jesus into our hearts. It's, it's more than just showing up for church on Sunday. It's, it's more than just having 10 minutes of quiet time before we start our day. It's, it's full time. It's complete surrender to God, to walking in his ways, listening for his voice, and, and bringing light and life wherever we go. It's about settling into a rhythm of life where these elements make up the music around us where we aren't marching to the beat of our own drum anymore, but rather seeking first the kingdom of God, of seeing his mission accomplished in this world. Our, our prayer is that his kingdom would come and that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the rhythm of our lives now. It's a kingdom rhythm. It's, it's one marked by connection with God and service of others, of, of loving God and loving our neighbor, of seeing the world through the eyes of Jesus and in light of eternity of recognizing the call of Jesus to continue the work he started and that he has sent us out to do. So how? How do we get in tune with that kind of rhythm? How do we, how do we shape our lives around those sort of values and mission? How do we get in time with the kingdom tempo and with the melodies that we hear in the spirit? How do we slow down? How do we shut out the noise? How do we keep in step with what God is doing? It's a choice. It's a choice for us daily to follow Jesus and to surrender to the leading of the Spirit. It's about taking up our cross, about laying down our lives and, and our passions and our desires and only thinking about ourselves and, and asking God how he might use us, how we might be faithful to him in everything that comes our way for that day. It's choosing to bless others and encourage others. It's, it's choosing to love God but also love our neighbor. And it's something that we can easily get distracted from. You know, we come in on a Sunday or we watch on a Sunday and, 
and, and we get encouraged and we're reminded again of the goodness of God and we spend some time in scripture and, and maybe we even eat together with some other people and, and we find ourselves investing in this spiritual life, this kingdom life, but then Monday rolls around and it gets a little harder to remember and Tuesday, Wednesday, and by the time we get to Thursday or Friday, we've kind of fallen away from the kingdom values that we hold dear because we get distracted. We get caught up in the worries of the world. We get caught up with a different rhythm. So perhaps there's a way we could shape our lives. Perhaps there's some way we could um, find ourselves walking in step with the Spirit a little more regularly by holding ourselves to some, some values or some ideas, a rhythm, a rule of life that might be helpful. This next little bit might be helpful for those who find themselves being easily distracted. Years ago, I, I met an Australian preacher and an author named Michael Frost. Um, he was in town for a conference and I'd read a few of his books and was fortunate enough to uh, end up at a table at a restaurant with him late one evening after the sessions had finished up. And at the time, I was a, I was a young church planter with a very small, some might even say struggling church plant. Um, we were doing our best to live out the gospel in a little different way than the traditional church. And, and we were discussing the, the shift that we were seeing in church circles away from like the standard sort of attractional model where we like put on big events and everybody comes to the church to, to more missional models of church where we're just out and about in the community spreading good news. And we spoke of the challenges that that sort of shift brought with it about moving away from a consumer mentality when it comes to church to a participatory mentality and the mission of God, that it's about us going. It's about us being scattered, not just gathered. That we don't just come to church to be fed. We gather as the church to be encouraged so that we can be scattered to our various places and positions to do kingdom work. And how do we stay focused with that? How do we stay on mission? And he shared with me something that his church uses as a regular reminder. They, they preach on it regularly. They teach on it. It was part of nearly everything they did as a church. He told me the key for them was bells. And I was like, bells? What are you talking about? Like church bells? He's like, no, 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 bells. Like bell stands for bless. Like bless three people this week. Eat. Yeah, eat with three people this week. L was for listen for the Spirit. Pray and listen to how God leads you through the day. The second L was to learn Christ, to, to learn the way that Jesus walked in the world and then walk in his ways. And the last one, S, was to see yourself as sent. That you are not one who is here to consume, but one who is to go out and make disciples. And that's something that bells, that really resonated with me, pun intended. But I didn't love the acronym. I didn't know if bells would be something that I would, um, you know, that would really ring true with me. Another pun intended. So I reworked that concept a little bit. I came up with a rhythm that made a little more sense for my life. So instead of bells, it's morphed into lives for me. I want to live in the kingdom. I want to live the life of Christ. I want to live the abundant life that God has called us. So lives stands for listen to God, invest in others, be versed in truth, eat with others, and be sent into the world. These are the things I see Jesus doing throughout the Gospels. These are the things I see regular um, people who want to be passionate disciples of his living out, where we, we listen to God, we listen for his spirit to be leading us. We spend time in prayer and we not only talk to God, but we listen to him. We, we invest in others. We, we see ourselves not as ones who are here only to receive, but because we've been freely given, we give to others that we look to invest in, we look to bless others, that we're versed in truth, that we, we spend regular time in scripture and, and learning from God and about God, that we try to understand the world through his eyes and, and what it means to be faithful to him as we, as we wrestle with the text. We eat with others, we, we regularly break bread and commune, that we have fellowship, not only with people who already know Jesus, but with people who, who are outside of the, our, our faith community. And we, we look to build relationship with people, just honest relationship where we break bread and share our lives with others because we see ourselves as sent to the world. We see ourselves as ones who are on a mission. Jesus regularly snuck away to pray with God and to listen to God. So many of the stories we read 
speak of him investing in others, whether it's teaching or healing, he was constantly pouring into others. He, he knew the word, he regularly taught on and applied it to situations that were in front of him. He was versed in truth. And whether it was the Last Supper or dinner with Levi and the tax collectors or, or over at Simon the leper's house, he often ate with others. And miraculous things happened around those tables. And all of this stemmed from the fact that he saw himself as sent to the world that he was on mission to seek and save the lost. He came to redeem us, to reveal the kingdom of God and the grace of God that all might see and know. He was sent to the world. And now he sends us. He invites us to, to follow him in all of those things and to settle into a rhythm that puts the kingdom first. In his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, he says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So this is the rhythm that I want to invite us into for the summer, and maybe even beyond, that grace lives for the summer, that we listen to God. Next week, we're going um, to be online and in person for a watch party uh, at the church, and we're going to talk about the various ways that we can pray and listen to and the leading of God's Spirit, how we can hear and discern the voice of God. The following week, we're going to talk about investing in others, how we can love in practical ways and through words of encouragement, uh, how we can help other people understand Jesus more clearly, whether they already know him or whether we're introducing them to him. We'll, we'll discuss what it means to be versed in truth, how the Bible helps us understand God and ourselves and how reading it and studying it alongside others will help us grow and mature in our faith. And, and one of my favorites is the second to last message in the series where we're, we're going to be encouraged to eat with others, to take time to, to break bread or even just grab a cup of coffee with people in your life. We were never meant to do this faith thing alone and we aren't meant to keep it to ourselves. So we'll talk about eating with people who already know Jesus and those who may not know him yet. And the last one sort of puts a bow on all of the other activity. Seeing ourselves as sent into the world not just as people who come to consume, not just as people who, who are looking to receive from God, but to see how God is calling us to walk in this world and walk in his footsteps. So for the next five weeks, we'll dig a little more into each of these rhythms and see how we can take up our cross daily and walk with Jesus. How we can shape our weeks in a more cruciform way, how we might structure our lives in order to walk more in his kingdom than just existing in our own. But for this morning, I wonder if you can hear the rhythm of your life right now. What tempo are you walking to? Is it, is it the demands of a job or the world around you that's driving you forward? Is there a competing rhythm in your heart? One that calls you to moments of rest and trust in God's provision? Is there a rhythm that causes you to, to think about eternity and to think about kingdom values, about things that are going on in the spirit that are beyond what we see right in front of us? See, that's the thing about rhythm. It's, it's all about this counterplay between the notes and the rests. Like the space between the notes sometimes give just as much feel as the notes themselves. In that iconic Phil of Phil Collins's, it's, it's like dun-dun, 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 dun-dun. Done, done. It's the last two that set off the rest of that fill. The other ones are just like, it's very repetitive, but the last one, there's a bit more of a rest. Done, done. And it, it gives that an incredible feel. It's iconic. So it's about the rests as much as it is about the notes. If your life had a soundtrack right now, what song would it play? And is it time to shuffle it up a little bit? Is it time to tune into the rhythm of the Spirit and to see how God might lead you in the weeks to come? I, I pray that we'd find ourselves keeping in step with the Spirit and leaning into the ways of life that call us to take up our cross daily and follow Him. Let's pray. Lord, there are times where this life seems to creep along at a snail's pace. And then there are other times where we feel like we're hurtling through sp space at like breakneck speeds. Would you, would you help us to settle into a healthy rhythm where regardless of what's swirling around us, our hearts are tuned into your spirit and are bent towards your kingdom? Would we find ourselves regularly listening to your spirit and investing in others, loving our neighbor and bringing blessing into the world? Would, would we wrestle with scripture and allow it to form and shape us in your image? Would we regularly commune with other people, sharing good food and words of life as we break bread together? Would we see ourselves as sent ones, sent into this world to partner with you as you build your kingdom here? 
that we might march to the beat of your drum, or, or maybe more aptly, we, we would dance to the rhythm of your spirit. Would you help us to hear the music? Help us to feel the rhythm and settle into it each day as we take up our cross and follow you. For we ask these mercies in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Next weekend is Canada Day. It's the July long weekend. And so we'll be having church at home for anyone who continues to join us here. But we'll be trying something a little different for our in-person gathering next week for the long weekend. We'll be giving the worship team a much deserved Sunday off and we'll be having a watch party here at the church. There'll be coffee and muffins for those who want to gather together and and watch the sermon online. Uh, We'll have regular kids ministry for those uh, who want to participate in that thanks to our summer team. We have some plans for the August long and September long weekend so stay tuned for that as well. We want to kind of switch it up a little bit through the summer here. So whether we see you online or at the watch party next week, we hope you have an amazing week. And until we see you again, may the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes, the love of God be reflected in your hands, the wisdom of God be reflected in your words, and the knowledge of God flow from your heart that all might see. And seeing, believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace to you.